Vindi, it's absolute delight to have you on the podcast today. I'm really excited because it's going to be an incredible conversation. You've been a global corporate executive, uh, 33 years at Unilever. You're a private equity investor. You're a non-executive director on some very big listed companies. You're a leader government agency, UKGI, and you're the chair of Marie Curie as well. So what an incredible lens and perspective you bring to the conversation today. Can I start by asking you, what does sustainable growth mean to you? Uh, well, first of all, Bina, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I think the key word there is sustainable. Um, you know, I grew up in Unilever, and uh, we believed in long-term growth, very long-term growth. And that's all about winning with consumers, winning with customers. It's about making sure you are attracting the very best talent everywhere in the world. It's about partnering with your suppliers. It's about giving back to your communities and, and being entrenched there. And more recently, it's actually been about making sure you don't deplete the environment. Unilever came to this last point. They had all the first points, I think, probably since it was founded over 100 years ago, but was early to the thought of the environment as well. I can remember way back in the 90s, when we were mandating all our factories in water short areas to do water harvesting and make sure they didn't deplete the water tables or indeed manage their waste so that they didn't damage the environment. And about 20 years ago, we led a study amongst the FMCG industry at the World Economic Forum in Davos to try and identify the impact on the environment from the industry. And surprise, surprise, we found that only 2 to 3% of the impact happened within the company. The rest happened either in the supply chain or actually at the front-end logistics, but when the consumer used FMCG products. I suppose the major lesson from that was you've got to work with everybody to solve these issues. But coming back to your question on sustainable growth, that's what it is, very long-term growth. And hey, I mean, Unilever's here today, 100 years after it was founded, 190 plus countries, 100 billion market cap. That's what sustainable growth is. What a lovely way to articulate it. So you just talked about the, the handprint of Unilever versus the footprint, the 2% versus the impact through the supply chain, which is something that is really important as organizations, because it's not just what we do, it's the collective and the system. Um, so you've worked in Asia and Europe, Vindi, and I just wondered, given your experience and just picking up on what you've talked about, your experience at Unilever, do you think attitudes to growth or sustainable growth differ across continents? Um, and do you think it's changed over time? You know, generalizations are always difficult and perhaps trite. But if I was to attempt one in response to you, I would say yes. I, I think Asia does think longer term in general. Uh, they have a long way to develop, and perhaps that's one reason, um, compared with the uh, manner in which, certainly in the developed and Anglo-Saxon world, uh, everything works to the quarterly result rhythm. I think also um, Asian companies tend to be largely family-owned or family-founded. They're still in that phase. And I think that's an important reason because they usually take that long-term perspective. You see that even in the manner in which Asian businesses think about their employees. Employees are just naturally family. You see so many examples where they cater to them through illness, through other issues, because there's no other state support. But also, they, they look upon them as their extended community. They provide housing, they develop communities. So I think the short answer is yes. I would put in one caveat, and I know there's a lot of criticism, perhaps to some extent justified, that as business in Asia has developed, it has perhaps thought less about the environment. But that's natural. You know, these countries have to get, you know, millions of people above the poverty line. They're still at that phase in many places. And therefore, that's been a natural phase. Now, in the last decade, I think that has manifested itself in a high level of pollution in many parts of Asia. I think that's been a big wake-up call, along with the general climate change uh, noise. And I see change happening there, as you asked. 
Uh, Asian businesses are far more focused on the environment today than they ever were. And as a evidence of this, I see even some of our sovereign wealth investors in CDNR, for example, whose wealth has been accumulated through the carbon industry. They are today one of the biggest and most focused on thinking about issues on the environment. So a lot of change happening. A lot of change happening. It's really interesting that you shed a light of the the sort of different stages of development across the world. And I guess it comes back to, you know, you've, you've got a unique perspective of sort of being in the corporate world, in the private equity world, as well as the business of government. And we talk about balancing the needs of people, planet and profit. Um, I just like your thoughts, you know, because you're, what you've articulated, it is slightly different depending on where you are, what sector you are working in. Do you have any, do you believe that we really can, over time, get to a point where we can balance well, I, I think if I go back to my, you know, the first conversation we had about Unilever, I think it is about thinking about all stakeholders. Yeah. That's how businesses win. They win by thinking about all the stakeholders, and that very much includes their communities and therefore the planet. So that's an important part of it. Uh, I think you, you talked about the government, uh, government uh, and, and it's quite interesting you said that. I mean, I recall, for example, when I was chairman of Unilever in India, one of the principles I always kept at the back of my mind is what's good for India will be good for Unilever in India. And so we were very willing participants and supporters of the development agenda in India. I see this across, I'd say, most of Asia, where business works hand in hand with the government to support the development agenda. I also see it, frankly, in a lot of European countries. But I would say that the Anglo-Saxon world somehow, business and develop and government perhaps could do more together to solve some of the big challenges that are being faced today. Just picking up on that, in the UK, um, what do you think we could do as business to really lean into some of these things that you're talking about? Well, I think let's take health. I mean, health is a big challenge everywhere in the world. In the developed world, it's such a big challenge because of aging, people are living longer, there are diseases of plenty. In the rest of the world, it's the opposite. There's malnutrition at the same time as diseases of plenty coming in quickly. Now, the UK, we know that health is a big issue. Uh, and I think, you know, business can play a role. Now, I've been fortunate to be part of several businesses that are engaged in health. I mean, at GSK, for example, Drug discovery is a very big focus. Vaccine discovery is a big focus. And the recent vaccine, for instance, for shingles is so relevant to the UK because of the average age of our population. I mean, shingles is a debilitating disease. Uh, now, making sure that those new innovations are available early in the UK is an ongoing challenge. If you take Helion, Helion is all about prevention and self-care in terms of health. So there again, I think it's a very big role that can be played. But I think it would be uh, um, wise to add in the role of the voluntary sector here. You know, I have the privilege of working with Marie Curie now for a few years. And uh, it's interesting, uh, at Marie Curie, we are able to take care of about 10 to 12 percent of the people who pass and their families every year. Um, and this need is only going to grow in the UK uh, because of the aging population. Um, and only 25 percent of our funding comes from NHS contracts. The rest actually comes from the public. So I, I think as far as health in the UK is concerned, everybody can play a role. Business for sure individuals, all of us. We're obviously very delighted because Marie Curie is KPMG's national charity too, and we work quite closely together. Um, just picking up on that point around sort of some of the things you've talked about, like vaccine development, also prevention, as well as providing for a growing challenge, right, which is in, our, in the UK a demographic issue. Businesses also have to balance long-term and short-term, right? And there's so much change. The pace, the pace of change is accelerated. And you have led businesses through significant transformations. I'd just love to get your perspective of how you balance that short-term need 
with the long term, the right decisions and how you make those decisions and in, a, in, a, in an environment of change. Well, this is a very difficult uh, uh, topic and it's not easy for leaders, uh, I think. So, so how does one approach it? I think it's important for a company to identify what its purpose is. And uh, I don't mean a lofty purpose of, of, you know, evangelism or something. It's got to be clear what it's there to do, what its role in society is. Once you have that, uh, you can form a plan to play that role and to win in that role. It's important to win in that role, in, in being the best at providing that role. Um, and that's the job of the leadership and the company. Now, that then translates into typically a three- to five-year plan with several initiatives. Uh, but, you know, the long term is a series of short term. And therefore, it's inevitable that you break that down into short-term milestones to measure how you're doing against that. I think that's where it becomes difficult because if you get thrown off the course, you miss something and things happen. External events happen, internal misses happen. It's really important then to judge and have the courage of conviction to stay the course or change course. And that judgment is very important at that point in time. Uh, and that's the role of the leadership. I think there are times when you just have to stay the course and, you know, accept that it'll take you a bit longer because you've, you external events or your own challenges have come in the way. And there are other times where you might need to change course, in which case you shouldn't be afraid of changing course. It's very important to carry all the stakeholders with you. Yeah. And typically in a public business, that's, that's your investors. And therefore, creating enough knowledge about your purpose, about your plan, about your milestones, and being transparent with them, open with them, I think is really crucial. And do you think, given your experience, you, you, you referred to it a little bit earlier on, you know, whereas in the West or in the public companies, you're sort of doing quarterly earnings. You also have great experience of being in the private equity space where maybe your, your horizon's a little bit longer. Um, do you feel that it is, it's easier to manage long-term and short-term decision-making and trade-offs and judgment calls in a, in a different environment? I think for sure. I mean, look, I, it's certainly... Um, easier to make those calls in the private capital markets. And the reason is the shareholders in the room. You know, typically in, in the private capital markets, you have one or a handful of shareholders, and they really understand the business uh, deeply with granularity, and they're in the room. So you can make those uh, decisions of long versus short-term trade-offs much more easily. Uh, in the public markets, the shareholders are not in the room. And it's the job of the board to actually understand what the shareholders want and to, to communicate back in a way the management and the board what the existing reality is. I think the other complexity in public markets is that different shareholders have different objectives. You know, some are more interested in short-term return, others are more interested in long-term return. So that adds to the challenge. And it's interesting, though, because whilst... Um, investors are looking at the short-term and long-term challenges, there is a real spotlight today on business to be delivering against the E, the S and the G, and therefore being de able to demonstrate the balance. And, and that's quite challenging, right? Because as you said earlier, not everybody's at the right stages to be able to affect balance but move in the right direction. Public markets have a real scrutiny over listed companies on their E, S and G, right? and whether it's their plans and how they report. In the private world, how do you as an investor really keep that focus on making that positive contribution? You know, it goes back to what we were discussing earlier about sustainable growth. Um, private capital typically takes on a business for a duration of five to six years. Um, and our job, is to improve that business in that period um, and to do it better than hopefully the prior owners. Now, improvement means better growth, better margins, profitability, but also a better level of core sustainability, a better ESG footprint. So I think from our point of view at CDNR, 
Uh, when we invest in businesses, we think very carefully about what are the longer term sustainability issues, which could be about the environment, it could be about social sustainability. That will be much longer than our time horizon of ownership. But we take those into account and we commit to improving those during the period of our ownership. Um, you're the chair of UK Government Investments, which is effectively the business of government. For, for those listeners who don't know what that is, would you be, would you be happy to share what, you, what that means? Well, UK Government Investments is a, is a really interesting uh, body. It, it is um, uh, under the Treasury, created by the Treasury some, some years ago. Um, we've got three principal functions. The first of these is to provide governance on behalf of the owners, which is the government, of about 24 or 25 arm's length bodies. What that means is that we provide, in most cases, um, a director on the board of those companies and provide the necessary governance support to the department in, in which that arm's length body is. Uh, that's one function. A second function is that we act as the corporate finance advisor. Uh, and just as in businesses, we would turn to Lazard or uh, Rothschilds or KPMG, for that matter, when we have uh, interesting questions to think about or deal with, the government turns to UKGI, and we are able to help answer those questions or provide scenarios. A third area which we've taken on more recently is to understand the liabilities of the state. Uh, and therefore, we've taken that on now for about a couple of years. So those are the three functions that we provide today. And they, by definition, are longer-term perspectives, are Yes, they? Uh, mostly longer-term perspectives. In some cases, though, they could be short-term crises, which the government is dealing with, which we are called into support. For instance, a UKGI was part of the COVID vaccine task force and other such initiatives. And I think that's probably something a lot of people don't really appreciate, you know, the, the breadth of what you what UKGI does. Um, you've said in the past that you, you only sit on boards where you feel you can learn and that you can contribute to, and you've had lots of experience. Um, what characteristics would you describe as um, being necessary for effective boards? Um, you know, I, I think... There are several topics here, but I think the first thing is um, having the right people on the board. And of course, that means the right mix of skills and experience, but it goes beyond that. I think it's really important for a board to have people who are curious, who are keen to learn about the business, about the industry, and also people who have low ego. Because our job is not to run the company. Our job is to support the management in running the company. So I think the first point is having the right mix of people on the board. The second is the appropriate level of engagement. You know, there are lots of boards where people, of course, read the papers and come to board meetings. But I think boards are far more effective when in between board meetings, they spend the time to really understand the business, to meet the customers, to meet the front end, people on the front end, and, and truly, truly internalize some of the issues of the company. So I think engagement is a second thought. I think the third is to be able to provide the right balance between the avoidance of risk and the maximization of opportunity. Too many boards spend more time on avoiding risk. And actually, I mean, that balance is hugely important because maximization of opportunities sometimes where the management needs the greatest support and greatest encouragement. And that's all about how the board spends its time, the agenda, the, the amount of time they spend on different issues of this nature. But I think last but definitely not least is the culture of the board. That's hugely important. You know, does the board have a culture where actually the real issues come to it? The truth comes to the board. You know, companies, almost any company you think of today is going through some form of transformation. And the very point of a transformation is that things aren't right. They have to change. So you've got to know exactly what it is. What is the state of play? And it's only then that you can truly engage with the management and be able to provide the constructive balance of both support but challenge. 
and bring your experience to bear on both sides of that. Right now, everyone is going through accelerated change. We're coming out of COVID, new ways of working. We've got technological advancements. And you're absolutely right for the board to be able to make a to support management and help them make the right decisions for the longer term, you need to have that openness. I love the way that you talk about those characteristics that we need in a board, curiosity, low ego. Low ego, definitely, engagement, and then culture. Culture is another word that we talk a lot about. Um, and so I just want to talk about you how you are known as being someone that's very ambitious around diversity and inclusion. You've also said a happy, healthy, um, diverse workforce is one of our greatest assets. So Given the environment we're in, given the changes our colleagues are feeling um, and the generational changes, do you think, what do you think business can do to really support a healthy, happy workforce? You know, this is a really important question and I think it goes beyond the workforce. Uh, I, I think if you look at the last 10 or 20 years, effectively, the divide between the haves and have-nots has grown everywhere in the world, virtually, whether in the developed world or the developing world. And I think it's incumbent on businesses to do everything they can to reduce that divide, uh, to increase diversity, to be more inclusive um, in totality. So what can businesses do? Well, at one level, of course, businesses um, can make sure that they are hiring more diverse talent, I think the gender issue is, of course, well recognized, but it goes beyond that. It goes to people from different stratas of society, from different backgrounds of education. So there's a whole stream about how you bring in people and how you retain them uh, from that point of view. And at, at Unilever, if I go back, our goal was always to make sure that we were bringing into our management people who reflected the society we sold our products to. And I think that broad brush was what we strove for to get to, th to the management and also to the leadership of Unilever. But businesses must go beyond that. That's about what, you know, the people they hire. And I think they must see what they can do with their resources into the broader ecosystem. If I go back to my experience with Unilever in India, one of the initiatives we had was Project Shakti. About 60% of India's villages were media dark and often could not receive our products, which were all about you know, hygiene in the end, household hygiene, personal hygiene. So we came up with this thought, actually inspired by the self-help groups from uh, Bangladesh, of empowering women in rural India, in these villages, by uh, helping the, them actually get trained to become distributors for our products uh, in those villages. And it was quite amazing to watch and energizing to watch how in a couple of days you could transform, help transform a person who's illiterate and doesn't know arithmetic, mathematics, into being a businesswoman who was able to carry the message of our products and also distribute them in the villages. And in a few years' time, we were able to empower perhaps 90,000 women. And this idea then went wider into the Unilever world. Why is this important? Of course, she earned an income. But what was actually the really big benefit is that her role at home changed. Her role in society changed. She was suddenly much more respected. So this is a force of inclusion and social change that business can play in its ecosystem or society. And last but definitely not least, I would say each one of us can play a role either by giving our time to uh, social endeavors. A Marie Curie is a, is a wonderful endeavor that uh, KPMG is supporting right through your employee stream, um, or even individually. Is there any one thing, if you could give a listener one thing to take away, what one thing could they really do to lean into social change? Uh, I think uh, pick whatever area uh, comes close to you uh, and give your time to that. I think we, we have, through the benefit of our education and experience, got a lot to give back uh, to organizations like this. And um, but I think we'll be more effective if we pick a space that touches us personally 
And I think that's one reason why I um, uh, was very privileged to become the chair of Marie Curie. I think, you know, palliative care is a very big problem. We've all had aged parents uh, go through the final years of their lives. And I think, you know, w watching that happen is something that motivates you to help others. Uh, and so I think pick a space that you connect with and give your time. I think it's such a lovely because time is the most precious thing we have. And you're right, whether it's um, in the charitable sector or actually in our organization and through some of the work that we, we do, it's even it's mentoring entrepreneurs, right? These, these budding entrepreneurs who can really make an impact and it's helping give them the confidence to, to, to succeed in what they do. We, when we first met uh, about 10 years ago, um, it was through your philanthropic efforts. You know, education was the reason we met. Um, you've set up a foundation. Would you mind sharing a little bit about the foundation and the context behind it? So, um, look, I, I think the background is simply this, that uh, we feel as a family that we've been lucky beyond belief uh, to have got to where we have and to have accumulated the resources we have. And uh, we definitely don't need these resources during our lifetime or indeed, uh, you know, for the next generation. So the question is, what can we do with it and how can we help others? Uh, so uh, we've set up this family foundation, which my wife chairs, um, and it's got two purposes at this point in time. The first is to support cancer research. And that's very personal to us because my wife has suffered cancer a couple of times. Um, and actually, it's incredible. Uh, although so much has been accomplished in that field, there's so much more to be done. Um, and so, so that's one focus area. And then the second focus area is education. And in particular there, uh, we are looking right now at trying to find ways and means of supporting the thrust towards STEM. You know, we, we both identify that to be a need gap in this country. And the real question is how we approach it. So I'd welcome any ideas, actually, for that. Very happy. We'll take it away as a, as, an, as a project to do for you, Vindi. But it's interesting, you know, given the focus you have personally, together with the work you do with Marie Curie, together with all the work that you do through the other organizations, how impact is very personal to you as well. Well, on behalf of Marie Curie, I would like to take this opportunity of thanking everybody at KPMG. We are so grateful for the help we receive from you. Great, I'm sure that everybody will be really appreciative. If you were to start your career again, would, what would, you, would you do anything differently? Would you, would you study something different? Um, because you're a learner, you, you know, you've always struck me as about wanting to explore and learn and you talked about curiosity. Is there anything that you would have wanted to master? Gosh, probably lots. Uh, because, you know, I don't think I've mastered a lot. Uh, but. I'm not sure that I would change fundamentally what I studied uh, or what I did or how my life turned out. You know, one can always make different choices, but I, I feel very privileged to have had the opportunities that I have had and had today. So I wouldn't change any of, uh, any of that. Um, what I would change perhaps is some of my own characteristics and how I approached life maybe. Um, I think in my early years, um, I would encourage myself today, if I could do it again, to move a bit faster. I think perhaps I was always looking for being 100% right, and uh, therefore maybe took a bit longer. It took me some time to realize that you'll never be 100% right. You know, life is not an exam, and uh, you're only going to be 75 or 80% right. So it took me some time to learn that. Uh, and to trust one's instinct and judgment. Um, I think the other aspect was in the, in the earlier years of my uh, work career, I would try and find the answer out myself by doing you know, lots of learning and, and deploying my curiosity. And actually, I realized later it was a lot simpler to ask others. You know, when, when you're young, you want to achieve everything by the next year or the next two years. And actually, what you don't realize when you're 25, is you're gonna work for the next 50 years. You have a long time ahead of you. So take your time. So, I mean, those are some of my lessons, I suppose, that I would try and pass back to myself. You're a very busy 
man. You have a lot of philanthropic interest. You've got your own foundation too, um, over and above the roles you hold. How do you sustain yourself? Well, look, I get energy from everything I do. Um, all the things that I'm involved in. I mean, I really enjoy my time at CDNR. Uh, I think um, it gives me the opportunity to look at business, to look at business across different sectors, to look at interesting questions on how we can add value. How can we do this better than anybody else? You know, that's the essence of investing in private equity. How can we create value that others can't see? And that's a wonderful uh, uh, challenge. And of course, the, the joy there is that you contribute and you continue to learn. So, you know, it gives me a lot of energy. I mean, Marie Curie gives me a lot of energy. Uh, in some ways, it's hugely satisfying. You know, when COVID hit, for example, uh, our fund collection dropped by, I think, almost 30 to 40 percent. And at the same time, uh, the need for our services went up. And there was a big question as to what we do and how do we manage through this period. But you know what? We did. The board, the management, we got together and we actually plowed through that period and we came through it, having taken care of more people than previous years and actually somehow came out of it with a healthy balance sheet as well. So I, you know, I, I get a lot of energy from all of the things I do, but also from my family. Um, I think, and in particular, my granddaughter uh, gives me a lot of energy. I mean, she has more energy than, than many people at that, you know, as I can imagine. Uh, but the other day she told me, for instance, she said that she had an opinion. And I said, well, what do you mean? You're only five. How can you have an opinion? <laughs> and she said, everybody has an opinion. So there you are. No, oh, well, very clever girl there. Very yeah. clever girl. Um, I, I, I just think this whole conversation has really captured the essence of Vindi. So you talk about life not being an exam. You talk about uh, being open to others supporting you. But really what struck me in this conversation was when you said, when you talked about Unilever, and what you said was what's good for India is good for Unilever in India. And that is the example that you set in terms, if you think of the bigger picture, you think of the whole, you think of social, you think of the profit, you think of the planet, it's got to be right for everybody. It's got to be right for and. And in particular, we've had these conversations, we know, in the private equity world, you know, the fact that you talk about having a longer term view beyond your ownership, Stenia, but actually being able to demonstrate how you're going to contribute to and commit to that change in the future. So making sure you're keeping an eye on it. And I think the other thing that I loved was your sort of qualities of effective boards, you know, the curiosity, the ego, the things that we don't really talk about, um, the culture, the maximizing. So thank you very much. This has been an incredible conversation. I I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Vinay.